Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. I trust you had a good weekend. Um, it's been raining cats and dogs over here, which is a good thing. It's after months of having to ship in water, we finally got water in the tap, so that's a good thing. I've been reading Mackinder, Halford John Mackinder's book about his visit to Kenya in 1899 and his ascent of Mount Kenya. And I'll put up three. The front page of the book, uh, um, the second is a description of Mombasa as he finds it, and the, the third is a description of Nairobi uh, in that same year. Um, very interesting blog. He's, he got up as far as Kibwezi on the train, then he had to walk, and uh, I've got, he's just left Nairobi and is describing um, the landscape. And also Salman Rushdie's The Golden House. The book begins with the election of Barack Obama and ends eight years later on the eve of an election in which the lead contender refers to himself as the Joker. Nero's character contains echoes of Trump too. is a man of fabulous wealth with a beautiful Russian wife and a fortune thought to be in part built on state. The novel's transnational supporting cast includes an Australian hypnotist, a Burmese diplomat, Ivy Manuel, a nightclub singer, a Somalian artist, and Nero's assistants, Fuss and Blada. As the election nears, America is deeply divided. It was a year of two bubbles, Rene muses. In one of those bubbles, the Joker shrieked and the laugh track crowd laughed right on cue. In that bubble, knowledge was ignorance, up was down, and the right person to hold the nuclear codes was the green-skinned, red-slashed mouthed giggler. Thus, by the book's end, the bubble of New York is where reality perseveres. Went back to one of my favorite poems from Thomas Pinch and Gravity's Rainbow. I dream that I have found us both again with spring so many strangers' lives away. And we so free out walking by the sea with someone else's paper words to say. They took us at the gates of green return, too lost by them to stop and ask them why. Do children meet again? Does any trace remain among the superhighways of July? This is indeed a rare sight of a Savo leopard spotted on patrol by our pilots, the Daphne Sheldrick people. And then this dish looked very tasty. The basement omakase menu will feature omi beef said to be the world's best wagyu plus caviar and truffles. And away from gastronomy, this 10-year-old Yemeni girl photographed after she was granted a divorce from her abusive husband. Political reflections, Arundhati Roy on jingoism, flags are bits of colored cloth that governments use first to shrink rack people's brains and then as ceremonial shrouds to bury the dead. US President Trump is seen feeding koi fish as Japanese Prime Minister Abe looks on in Tokyo on November the 6th. To bow or not to bow, Trump passes tricky protocol test with Japanese emperor. The FT had a big long read about how Trump is under siege from Robert Mueller III as he travels to Asia. At the best of times, White House aides fret about Trump's capacity to make gaffes. The penalty for miscuing on Trump's 12-day Asian tour, which started on Friday, is higher than normal. It will be his first visit to China and his first meeting with Xi Jinping since he joined the immortals Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping by having his ideas enshrined in China's constitution. 
The contrast between the two presidents could hardly be sharper. Mr. Z was confirmed last month for another five-year term with no successor lined up. His grip on power is tightening. Mr. Trump's White House is under siege from Robert Mueller's Russia collusion probe. The president is likely to be more distracted in the coming days than usual, even without the geopolitical landmines in his path. Will Trump congratulate Z on his election victory, asks a former Bush administration official. It is no joke. That is exactly the type of error he makes. Mr. Trump's trip is vulnerable on two counts, domestic and global. The first is that he is engulfed by the crisis back home. The damage to his standing is already bad. On Monday, Mr. Mueller indicted Paul Manafort, Mr. Trump's former campaign manager, on 12 counts, including tax evasion, money laundering, and conspiracy against the United States. Several times earlier this year, Mr. Flynn dropped thick hints that he wanted to cooperate with the inquiry. He has gone silent in recent months. The chances that Flynn is already cooperating with Mueller are reasonably high. Trump and his crowd are like a crew in Goodfellas, said a veteran of the Reagan and Bush, Bush campaigns. They are tight-knit, yet distrusting of each other, impulsive, profane, and remorseless. Mr. Mueller's probe is as tentacular as Mr. Trump's business history. Whether he can prove Mr. Trump directly colluded with Russia, let alone submit a charge sheet for impeachment, is secondary at this point. The world is being offered an X-ray vision of Mr. Trump's circle that tarnishes American values from China or Russia's point of view, the Mueller probe is the gift that keeps on giving. 7th of August, I wrote how any financial expert will tell you that Mr. Trump's financial affairs are a smoking gun and that there is a prima facie case here and it's in plain sight. Now, big events in the kingdom, Saudi purged senior princes and top billionaire was detained. King Salman removed one of the royal family's most prominent princes from his ministerial role and arrested other royals and top officials in an anti-corruption drive that clears any remaining obstacles to his son's potential ascension to the throne. Acting on orders from a newly established anti-corruption committee headed by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, Security forces arrested 11 princes, four ministers, and dozens of former ministers, according to Saudi media, and a senior official who spoke on condition of on anonymity. Prince Miteb, son of the late King Abdullah, was removed from his post as head of the powerful National Guard. Prince Al-Walid bin Talal, one of the world's richest men, was picked up at his desert camp, the senior official said. Authorities did not disclose the evidence that, prompt, that prompted the arrests. Laws will be applied firmly on everyone who touched public money and didn't protect it or embezzled it or abused their power and influence, King Salman said. This will be applied on those big and small and we will fear no one. So King Salman's decree invests the new anti-corruption committee with draconian powers. Um, as, as we said, the decree says the Anti-Corruption Committee shall be exempted from laws, regulations, instructions, orders and decisions while performing its task of identifying offences, crimes, persons and entities involved in cases of public corruption. It empowers NBS to issue arrest warrants, travel ban, disclosure, freezing of accounts, portfolios, tracking of funds, assets as well as taking precautionary measures. Talal, of course, saved Trump from bankruptcy in the 90s. The Ritz-Carlton Riyadh is now the de facto Royal Hotel, evacuated on Saturday and is a detention camp for royals. Hoya Wolf, who's a friend of mine on Twitter, says these moves have been a long time coming. I said, where is it going in your opinion? He says, I'm not sure, but the steps toward real reform seem to be authentic. I said, I agree, but foreign policy misadventures and Iranians under the bed tend to blunt um, the reform thrust, in my view. 
by a wolf how to reform and simultaneously be fully engaged with an activist foreign policy stuck in overdrive. Take you back to May 2017 when the Crown Prince said, how can I communicate with them while they prepare for the arrival of Al-Mahdi al Montazar? Saudi Prince Al-Walid was a vocal Trump hater. Take a look at this tweet posted by the now arrested Saudi Prince in 2015, no friend of Donald Trump's. Um, the airport for private planes was closed, arousing speculation that the Crown Prince was seeking to block rich businessmen from fleeing. And then furthermore, a helicopter carrying eight senior Saudi officials, including Prince Mansour bin Mukreen, advisor to the sacked Crown Prince MBN, crashed. Patrick Coburn is saying Donald Trump's best new policy in the Middle East would be no new policy. The Lebanese president says Prime Minister Hariri phoned to resign from outside the country. So we got plenty going on, heightened geopolitical risk in one of the main suppliers of oil to global markets. Some moves in Lebanon which are signaling a response against Hezbollah is probably imminent. Zimbabwe arrested a U.S. citizen for allegedly tweeting that Mugabe is a goblin. The Catalan leader, Puigdemont, has turned himself in into Belgian police. The Nikkei is up 17% in less than two months. Currency markets, Euro dollar 116.10, dollar index 94.92. The priced in probability of a Fed interest rate hike December 13 policy meeting is now 92.3%. Japanese yen last trading at 114.27, touched 114.66, the highest since March. Swiss franc is above parity at 1004. The pound at 130.71. The Australian dollar is last trading at 0.7652, India rupee 64.655, South Korean won 11.1701, the real 331.44, Egyptian pound 17.6415, South African rand 14.20. Dollar index is still in an uptrend notwithstanding the hot breath of Robert Mueller somewhere in the background, euro dollar I'm still looking for a further breakdown towards a 114 handle, currently trading 116.10. Commodity markets gold is at 1270, hasn't been able to find any upside momentum, notwithstanding what I would describe as sharp and geopolitical risk. Oil hit its highest level since 2015 amid tightening markets and Saudi purge. Brent futures hit $62.44 early on Monday. Highest level since July 2015. WTI hit $56 and it's back there right now. Also the highest since July 2015. Put up a chart of WTI crude oil that has rallied sharply. And I think that's on a perception that we're dealing with the tighter markets and also increased geopolitical risk. Let's move on to Africa. There's a very interesting exclusive in the Mail and Guardian how South Sudan's elite looted its foreign reserves. I actually saw this firsthand, but that's a story for another day. On a hot, dusty day in April 2015, generals, ministers, senior ruling party officials and members of parliament descended on the offices of the ministry complex in Juba. Some army men came in their uniforms, accompanied by a flock of AK-47 toting soldiers. Others, perhaps less willing to be seen, sent letters with requests bearing the seal of whatever government institution they worked for. Some would simply pick up the phone to give instructions. Saying at first sight it might have looked like an emergency meeting of the country's leadership. In fact, South Sudan's elites were scrambling to cash in on dwindling foreign reserves. This had become the most sought after commodity, especially for those in power. And what effectively happened, the central bank was giving out money at the official rate at a time when the black market rate had gone in about ten to four, about eight times higher, and people were able to take uh, money at the official rate, exchange it at the unofficial rate, and make a killing. Um, the dollar allegations were dispersed through the Qatar National Bank and CFC Stanbic in South Sudan, transferred mostly to banks in Uganda and Kenya, 
including Kenya Commercial Bank, Barclays, Equity Bank, and Stanbic Uganda. And this is an important point. Since the transactions occurred in US dollars and were cleared through US correspondent banks, US law enforcement agencies could assert jurisdiction to prosecute any transactions found to violate US anti-money laundering laws. Worth a read. Keir is tightening the noose on his former military chief Malong after officer close to him last week revolted, tensions growing, his house, he's under house arrest. Mugabe set to appoint woman deputy, all eyes on his wife. Bulawayo 24 saying a military coup is likely in Zimbabwe. Vice President Emerson Mnangagwa's ally, controversial businessman Energy Motudu, says a coup is likely in Zimbabwe if President Mugabe fails to carefully choose his successor amid rising succession tensions within the ruling ZANU PF. As Mugabe clings on, his economy goes micro at a dusty market stall. Anna Magai dulls out tiny portions of used cooking oil measured carefully in a miniature perfume bottle. Uh, people have no money. Even the multinational food company Nestle has opened a new packaging plant in Zimbabwe to sell its product in 35% packages. John Robertson calculates that Zimbabwe's official money supply jumped by 36% in 12 months after August 2016 because of heavy government borrowing from the banks. It's a clear warning of inflation, he says. Prices haven't ballooned yet, but they could. The state borrowing has sucked cash out of the banks and off the streets. Banks have been forced to limit withdrawals and pensioners can't get access to their savings. Some banks in recent days have halted all withdrawals because they simply had no cash. We've nearly hit rock bottom, Mr. Robinson says. July 2016, I was a bit early, but I said countries like Zimbabwe feel like they're right at the edge. The edge was described thus by Hunter S. Thompson. There is no honest way to explain it because the only people who really know where it is are the ones who have gone over. DR Congo is setting an election for December 23rd, 2018, says the Electoral Commission. Rebellion fears grow in eastern Congo. Uh, attention is focused on the raging conflict and humanitarian crisis in Kasai in the southern DRC. Armed opposition groups in the east of the country have stepped up attacks and are threatening to wage all-out war. Uh, lots of uh, uh, information coming out of these Paradise Papers, Glencore's secret loan to secure DRC mining rights. Glencore loaned Gertler $45 million with the caveat that it would be repayable if agreement with DRC authorities was not reached to secure a mining contract for a company linked to Glencore. Who have with children wash on the shore of Lake Kivu on Ijwi Island in the DR Congo? This is Reuters in Africa. Peter Hain, who's spoken uh, uh, in the House of Lords about money laundering in South Africa, says it's fascinating being remorselessly targeted. Zuptoy bots, fake tweets, blatant lies, racism, wasting their time like apartheid attacks on me did. Take your money out of South Africa, says an economist. This is shattering advice given by Efficient Group's chief economist, Dawi Root, following the release of the Auditor General's report on national irregular expenditure. The public needs to be made aware of Jack Paul's grave allegations. Indeed, they do. South African all share is up 17.74% year to date at a record high. Dollar Rand is around the 1420 level, headed to 1440. Nigerian writer Wally Soyinka on coup culture and challenging Castro in an interview with David Pilling. It is just as the main course arrives that Wally Soyinka, playwright, poet, novelist, essayist and part-time agitator, reaches into his pocket and brings out a plump green chili. Actually, when I travel, I always carry a special paste which I made for me, a paste which I put in my pocket. Very interesting interview. Nigerian all share up 37.45% year to date. Ghana stock exchange up 40.15% year to date. Tanzania's experiment with multi party democracy may be drawing to a close after 25 years and five general elections, says Africa Confidential. 
During my morning tour, I met Panina Kaitingamba, a neighbor whom I gave a bowl to fertilize her cows and improve milk yield, the president of Mussolini. At the first centenary celebrations at All Saints Cathedral, at the end of the day, were all Kenyans, President Kenyatta, and Raila Odinga at the service. Kenya's opposition ramps up campaign for new election. The economic liberation program began on Friday with a call to Kenyans to stop using the goods and services of Safaricom, the country's dominant mobile telecom company, Brookside, the largest dairy company, and Bidco manufacturer of edible oils and other consumer products. NASA is planning to hold a People's Assembly and protest as part of its campaign to force a new election by the end of January. James Wendai, one of the two dozen NASA MPs who unveiled the boycott, said there is no price too high to pay for democracy. Mr. Otiena said he thought part of NASA's strategy might be psychological warfare. The aim might be to bring the business community into the national political conversation. He added, if business owners are saying loudly that the suffering then the government might be more inclined to listen to the opposition. Irin has an interesting article, Who Owns Kenya? Saying the election crisis is really a struggle over elite power. The real question is whether the Wenyenchi, the owners of the nation, will give up their control of the state to the one enchi, the people of the nation, whether they will allow the constitution to dismantle and remake the colonial state into one that works for all Kenyans. Kenya shilling is at 103.73, Nairobi all shares up 23.37% year to date. Um, we're calling for a boycott that will hurt, a boycott that will be painful, a boycott that will bring these corporations to their knees and to senses until they stand up for electoral justice expressed through free, fair and credible elections. NASA. Majority of Kenyans criticize government performance on keeping prices stable, creating jobs and managing the economy. This is Afrobarometer. Uh, my weekend piece was about, about Safaricom. I said this is the best time to buy Safaricom. Safaricom is the big beast at the NSC, carries a market capitalization of 1.021 trillion shillings, which represents 42.63% of the value of the entire stock exchange. Safaricom has served up a mouth-watering 38.22% total return in 2017, which is close to twice the return of the Nairobi All share. These raw numbers confirm the importance and centrality of last week's earnings release to Kenya Inc., Mr. Colin Moore has presided over a miraculous 420% share price appreciation that is excluding the very juicy dividends that shareholders have received during his tenure. A performance that has only been bettered by the likes of Apple, Amazon and Alibaba. Safaricom under Mr. Colin Moore exists in the very top percentile of worldwide performance and consequently last week's earnings, earnings release resonates worldwide. The value of Safaricom is much more than the share price performance. It's produced a plain exponential return. KPMG estimates that the total value Safaricom created for Kenyan society in the full year 2017 was 486 billion shillings, around 10 times greater than the financial profit the company made in the same year. It's produced a plain exponential return. The ubiquity of M-Pesa allowed us to reinvent our brand which, by the way, has been taking some very big hits of late um, across the world. Last week's earnings release, importance cannot be gained. Say, Collymore is in London, and I'm reliably informed. Watch last week's proceedings on the live feed. In his absence, Safaricom subtly sent a message of bench strength with the thoughtful chairman Nicholas Nganga, the CFO Satish Kamath, and Joseph Agutu, Director of Strategy and Innovation, taking up the baton. Safaricom reported a 12% shift higher in first half services revenue, which clocked 109.73 billion. Customer numbers, the demographic dividend, grew 10.8% to 29.5 million. First half net income expanded 9.5% to 26.2 billion. And if we exclude a one off positive adjustment from the previous set of results, first half net income grew 21.4%. Voice revenue grew 3.6% to 47.35 billion. 
Nearly every year, for as long as I can remember, folks have been keen to pronounce the last rites on voice. But year in, year out, Safaricom has confounded the naysayers. Voice at plus 3.6% discount intuitively off the chart. SMS revenue clocked a 3.4% increase to 8.92 billion. I recall Bob telling me a few years ago how he was increasing the spike limit of the SMS platform by a factor of 10. And I thought to myself, why on earth is he doing that? WhatsApp was lifting off just about that time. Today, when the betting companies blast via SMS, they utilize 100% of that spike capacity increase. Safaricom have proven skillful at maximizing yield, really skillful. Let's now turn to the more go-go trajectories. H1 mobile data revenue accelerated 31% to 17.55 billion. Satish informed me that average per capita mobile data consumption accelerated 66%. This confirms Kenya Inc. is surfing the new 21st century information superhighway. Something Alibaba's Jack Ma also alerted us to when he visited. He was asked about our infrastructure deficit and replied, but the most important infrastructure in the 21st century is the internet and yours is fast. Safari Combo invested heavily in building out this 21st century information highway. It represents the democratization of data and Safaricom have given every Kenyan an entry ticket, not any old entry ticket, but a Ferrari to this new 21st century of ours. Calls for the boycott of Safaricom is kindergarten politics and will surely tip opposition strongholds into economic recession. Ubiquitous M-Pesa platform grew first half revenue 16.2% to 30.05 billion. Higher frequency data confirms a slowdown in the velocity of mobile money since August, and I have to believe that within this first half revenue narrative is a story of two halves, with the second half materially slower than the first. M-Pesa continues to expand its platform capabilities and is deeply embedded in the economic ecosystem. Chairman Nicholas Nganga spoke of Safaricom casting its eyes beyond our borders. Shareholders, in my view, have not baked this news into the share price. M-Pesa, for example, surely can be inserted into many countries on this continent. Safaricom also launched their Soko e-commerce platform. E-commerce has exploded. It's made Jeff Bezos of Amazon the richest man on the planet. And Jack Ma cannot be far behind. E-commerce is going to be a very big thing. And Safaricom have all the levers with which to secure a leadership position in this space. Their M-Pesa agents can double up as delivery points, for example. Any share price softness is an opportunity for investors to load the boat for the next leg higher. Stanley Druckenmiller said the way to build superior long-term returns is through preservation of capital and home runs. When you have tremendous conviction on a trade, you have to go for the jugular. It takes courage to be a pig. Safaricom share price data is linked on rich wrap-ups. M-Pesa transaction values is seen in this uh, image. Um, Reuters TV have a, have a little section on Kenya's politics and economics. Take a look at that. NSE 20 up 19.28% year to date. And finally, the last item on the page is if you want to check any uh, share price data, that link will help you do it. Thank you so much for stopping by.